All right, looks like we're gonna go ahead and get started. So hi everyone, thank you for joining us for the Cancer Center um, Symposium Series. And I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Francesco Amara today from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center as our invited speaker. Dr. Mara received his medical degree from the University of Milan. And from here, he went on to do his postdoctoral fellowship at the Welcome Sanger Institute under Dr. Peter J. Campbell, who is one of the co-heads of the Cancer Genome Project. And while there, he focused on cancer genome evolution. And he was also the lead scientist in one of their collaborative projects where they investigated the genomic landscape of myelomagenesis. Um, he's currently an assisting attending at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and his lab focuses on investigating myelomagenesis and subclonal evolution by employing integrated sequencing approaches. And in recent years, since his lab has begun, his group has published a number of papers in high impact journals. And so now I'll hand it over to Francesco, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and for the kind introduction. So, Francisco, uh, can I just say real quick, uh, just to, sorry to remind everyone to go ahead and uh, mute their microphones so we don't have any uh, background noise. There's a couple people that look like they're still not, not muted. So, sorry, take it away. Okay, so let's uh, uh, try to. So, the, the, you should see my screen right now, right? Looks good. Francesco, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, wait a second. I think you're good to go now, Francesco. Sorry about that. It's, it's okay now? Yes. Oh, because you unmute me, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> I was like looking uh, where, what I, <laughs> what I've done. Okay, um, yeah, so um, during this presentation, we will go through some of our uh, recent data and I will uh, uh, conclude the presentation with, I think, uh, uh, a really important story though a small court, but I think uh, it will have a major impact for the upcoming years. So uh, I think most of you know what multiple myeloma is. It's an hematological cancer, so probably the second most frequent hematological cancer in US. And the um, fascinating, at the same time, terrible things about multiple myeloma is its heterogeneity. So we have patients with lytic lesions. Uh, we have patients with uh, that provide like create the back pain, for example, or fractures. We have a kidney failure. We have uh, uh, infiltration with anemia. And usually multiple myeloma, it's an easy diagnosis once occurred because we have a, a, a canonical monoclonal gamma, uh, component that is easy detectable uh, in the, uh, serum, with the serum electrophoresis. So as often occur in cancer, heterogeneity in the clinical presentation underline heterogeneity in its biology or in its genomic. And, uh, Considering how easy it is to detect multiple myeloma, we know that historically uh, the evidence of a multiple myeloma precursor condition like MGAS or smoldering multiple myeloma has been known for more than 50 years now. And so obviously a lot of people are excited about chlorinamopoiesis now because it's the precursor of AML. But if you go back and see a lot of papers with MGAS and smoldering, we actually can find the same things like associated with aging, associated with secondary cancer, with cardiovascular events. So we know that these events tend to occur more in elderly patients, but some fraction of these patients progress to multiple myeloma. And this is obviously an important clinical window because we need to understand which patients we want uh, to treat before the symptoms occurrence. Because when we have an MGAS and a smoldering, we know that these already a genomic competition. We know that there is this uh, clonal tides or these subclones that compete to gain the proliferation advantage. And, why, and usually these phases are characterized by just some clonal population in the marrow and just some electrophoretic, electrophoresis abnormalities, so no symptoms. But when multiple melanoma occurs, symptoms are pretty bad. And so we want to avoid this to our patients because some of these symptoms are also life-threatening. So we 
the menu for today, bringing back my Italian um, soul, uh, are four main points. So we will go through mutational signatures as the first. And uh, it's a concept that usually people uh, um, tends to not really consider. And, but I think it's critical, in particular in multiple myeloma. And uh, so for people that are not confident with the, this concept, uh, we know that uh, on the DNA, we can acquire six possible mutations, C2A, C2G, C2T, C2A, C2C, C2G, these six. And we call six because saying C2A is exactly the same to say uh, G2T, because we have the double strand helic uh, according to Watson and Crick model. So we have these six possible mutations. And if we consider the trinucleotide before and the trinucleotide after our mutated nucleotide, so that so-called trinucleotide context, we can see that we have 16 possible trinucleotide contexts. So if you multiply all six possible combinations for the 16 possible trinucleotide contexts, we get this combination of 96 uh, possible mutations. And this is, I think, was the extremely clever idea that Mike Stratton and Ludmila Alexander developed in the Sanger Institute with, together with Serena Nick Zainal. Uh, and because as you can see, this is like a group of multiple myeloma, each bars represent one of the disease classes and each color, blue, black, represent one of the six possible classes. So you have 16 uh, bars for each type of mutations. And you can see the distribution of mutations is not uh, it, like homogeneous. It's not that mutations can occur randomly. It's actually uh, biased. So you have these peaks, for example, are a trinucleotide context that tends to acquire more mutations, for example, than this one. And so what people discover is that if we deconvolute this profile, that is the sum of the entire mutations, mutational burden in one cancer or in a group of cancer, we can extract the components or what we call signatures that should be imagined like a barcoding. So this I think is a seminal paper. Uh, it's important, but it's also kind of easy uh, or is one of the best way to understand why signatures are important. So in this study, Ludmila Alexandrov and Mike Stratton from Sanger Institute, they look at uh, uh, different tumors or tumors that are known to be associated with an increased risk or increased incidence among smokers. And they say, okay, smoke is uh, uh, a, we know, pro-cancer uh, agent. So we want to look uh, which mutations are caused by smoke. And using this mathematical model that we don't have time to investigate, uh, it's a bit complicated, but you can extract from the profile of the disease classes different components, like signature 2, signature 5, signature 13, signature 16. But what they are like in this paper is a signature 4, OK, this distribution of mutations. And these signatures is enriched only in tobacco smoker lung adenocarcinoma, but not in non-smokers adenocarcinoma, for example, or in many other cancers like bladder and others that are known to be associated with smoke. So they investigate this in vitro, and they found that the same mutational profile can be derived exposing normal cell lines to benzopyrin, which is the procancerogen element in the tobacco smoking. So that tells us that using this mathematical decomposition, these mutational signatures, we can actually understand which mutational processes are active. And these profiles that you see here are not just mathematical decomposition, reflect existing processes, something that is real. And so we can better understand what's going on in our cancer. So we investigate the mutational signature landscape in multiple myeloma using a, a court of 89 genomes from uh, uh, 52 patients. So there were multiple patients with uh, multiple samples collected at different time points. We run our mutational signature uh, workflow that we published recently, and we don't have time to go through it. But the overall idea is that the final result, let's say, is always the same. We define eight main signatures active in multiple myeloma. So we have signature one and five that are so-called aging signatures associated with the um, aging and they are like constant over time. Uh, and what I want to talk now is mostly is as Apobec. So signature two and signature 30. So Apobec uh, is usually present in many solid cancers. It's rarely present in hematological cancers, but interestingly, 80, 90% of multiple melanoma patients have evidence of Apobec activity. Apobec is associated with very poor prognosis. These are data from the COMPASS trial that we published three years ago. You can see that the dividing in quartile for Apobec, for the number of mutations that we can assign to Apobec, we have this very short survival. And Apobec is also associated with MAF translocations that we know uh, is a, a, another poor feature. The important concept that people 
really never investigate about Applebeck in Matipomelam, and I think we were the first, is that not all Applebeck are the same. What does it mean? You can see here, uh, we can divide mutations in Applebeck um, in Applebeck 3A and 3B, because Applebeck is like a large family of the amidates, like also AID is part of the same uh, family. So we have these two main uh, units, Applebeck 3A and Applebeck 3B. So Applebeck 3A and usually activity is usually the same that Applebeck 3B. You can see that most of the patient, the ratio between Applebeck 3A and 3B number of mutation is around one. And then you have this group of patients where uh, you have that uh, math, uh, uh, acid with math, uh, where you have a very high mutational burden. So math uh, in activate somehow Applebeck through a link that we don't know exactly how this happened, but we know that is that it, uh, it happens immediately after math is translocated. So it's something that starts since the beginning, since the initiation of the tumor. And you can see that the amount of mutation is higher in general, but also the Applebeck 3A, 3B is higher. So we can divide Applebeck activity in two different uh, forms. One is Applebeck, what we call canonical activity, where ratio is one to one. And one is the what we call, um, well, not in a very scientific way, hyper Apobec, where Apobec 3A is two or three times more than Apobec 3B. So the second point of this presentation always connect to mutational signatures as how we can use mutational signatures to time our events. So I show you how we can use mutational signature to better predict the high risk in multiple myeloma. So now we can see how mutational signature are, uh, can be used to time the events in multiple myeloma. So again, this is a slide that I showed you before. Unfortunately, for time uh, reason, we can't go through each of these signatures, but the next group of signatures that uh, I would like to um, explore a bit more is signature one and five. So those signatures are so-called the uh, clock-like mutational process, which means that in this moment, my cells or some cells in, our, in my body, and I think also in yours, if you are human, are getting these mutations. These are spontaneous mutations acquired in every single li uh, living beings, also like tiger, cats, uh, you can find this distinct profile, signature one and signature five, in every human being, in every like living form on, on the earth. And we know that because people have been sequenced also, you know, animals uh, or Neanderthals, and you can find this in every uh, life, form of life. But what is interesting about this is that these are accumulated over time in a constant way. And this is why Ludmila Alexander and Mike Strachton call them clock-like because if you compare the mutational burden of the clock-like mutation of a normal uh, colorectal crypt from a pediatric patient to an elderly, the pediatric patient will have less mutations compared to the elderly. So there is like a, a linear regression, significant regression between uh, correlation, positive correlation between the number of mutations in H1 and 5 and the biological age of uh, our patients or also of healthy individuals. So uh, I have more mutations than my son that tried to enter in my room before. Uh, so we use uh, this mathematical model uh, um, that was previously, that we published previously with Tom Mitchell in kidney cancer uh, to predict if this is true in multiple myeloma, because obviously it's true in many, many tissue, but you have to test or prove every time for your tissue if no one has done it before and also try to estimate the mutation rate for each single patient. That's it's a more bit like trickier part. So putting aside the methodology, we can summarize this analytical process using this picture. So in this figure, you have that you have multiple dots. Each dot represents one patient, one sample, sorry. And the colors represent uh, um, samples from the same patient. So for example, these three blue, light blue, dots represent three samples collect from the same patients at, the, at three different time points. So some patients have multiple samples, some have less, some have two, one, three, four. So if we have multiple samples from different patients, we can estimate the mutation rate for this individual patient corrected for the global mutation rate. So the black line is the global mutation rate for signature five, one of the two clock-like mutational signatures. And the each color line, like this uh, um, gold green line, is the mutation rate of these patients with, who had these two samples. 
So this mutation rate is corrected for the entire mutation rate in multiple myeloma and corrected for possible bias related to sequencing, like coverage, purity, employee. And also, we allow the quadratic term of age, we include the quadratic term of age, which is a way to take into account the possible acceleration. So people, some people, not everyone, uh, think that at a certain point, this clock is lost because the tumor just progressed too fast and more mutations are acquired. So it's like an exponential growth. So we took into account also this. And we see that the mutation rate is constant and we extrapolate the mutation rate for each single patient. So that's important. Keep in mind for a few seconds, I'm gonna introduce another concept and we will combine the two. So if we have the mutation rate, we have to use the mutation rate on certain mutational burden. So we can, and the mutation rate was extracted considering the total mutation burden, which is a group of mutations composed by clonal and subclonal. So for example, when people work on uh, reconstructing the chronology in cancer, in genomics, uh, they used to divide the mutations in clonal and subclonal uh, using this uh, phylogenetic tree representation. So you have the clonal are supposed to be in the trunk, which, is, uh, uh, which represent mutations that are shared by all cells. And the branches are the famous, like the subclone evolutions where you have one clone and other clone and then additional subclones. And using this way, we can compare clonal versus subclonal, and we can see what is early versus what is late. And this is what a lot of people, including us, have been doing for years. So we can add, in particular, maticopoloma, an additional temporal window, because we want to investigate the history of our cancer. So if we just take the picture of the diagnosis, it's just a picture. But if we have multiple pictures during the tumor evolution, it's like reconstructing an old movie where you put multiple picture and go, um, you let them scroll fast and it's like a movie. So the idea is that multiple myeloma has multiple gains. As we know, 60, 70% of patients have uh, at least two large trisomies involving uh, odds chromosomes. And uh, so when a trisomy is, or like an entire allele or arm is duplicated, all the mutations acquired at that point, these red mutations, will be duplicated. So instead of having two alleles, you have three alleles. And instead of a V allelic frequency, like number of reads of supporting this mutation, instead of being 50%, you will have 66% because there will be two thirds of the total reads that sequence these chromosomes. The yellow stars, the mutations present on the alley that is not duplicated, will change their VLD frequency after duplication from, from 50% to 33%, one out of three. So when this occurs, then you have a, a certain time where all these alleles are exposed to different mutational process, like the clock light that are present in every genomes and in every cell. And so they will acquire mutations, but the probability that two mutations occur on the two duplicated allele in the same position, it's really, really unlikely. So we have two group of mutations, one group duplicated, what we call duplicated mutation or VLE frequency 66%, and a group of mutations that we can say post gain, most of them, where the VLE frequency is 33%. So it's present only on one allele and not on two, like the pre-gain. So we can divide mutation, clonal mutation in pre-gain, post gain, and we can compare them also with the subclonal. So we can actually create three time windows, pre-gain mutation, post-gain, and subclonal. It's not like a real movie, but still is better than only one picture. So if you remember, we have estimated for the same court where we divided the mutation in pre-post-gain and in subclonal, uh, we estimate the mutation rate for signature five, uh, which is one of the clock-like mutation constant over time. So if you know the number of mutations acquired before the gain, so the mutations that are present uh, as clonal and with a VLL frequency of 66% within large chromosomal gains, you can actually divide this number of mutations for your mutation rate. And what you get is the time that the cells require to get that gain. So it's the time in patient life in which that gain was, was acquired. So uh, these are our estimates. So the mm, uh, green, the dark dots is the acquisition of the gain. We have a large interval of confidence. Obviously these are like mathematical model. So there is a, a, um, 
important uh, grade of uncertainty. And the second the light the green is the second game because we know from our previous story in 2019 with Peter Campbell that not all multiple myeloma trisomies are acquired at the same time. So we look for trisomies that show evidence to be acquired close one to another or within the same time window. And then in the uh, red dots are the diagnosis. So you can see that most of the patients acquire the first game in the first, in the second, first decades of life, usually when the patient is around 20 years old, with the median time between initiation and multiple myeloma diagnosis of 37 years. So when I show this data the first time to some myeloma people, some were like, oh, wow, that's great. And then I show to my boss uh, at MSK, Ola Langren, as a hiring talk, and he say, oh, well, I'm not impressed because, uh, um, you know, from population study, like these two, we, uh, we know that there is a phase before the MGAS, before the smoldering, that we cannot detect with the current technology, but with new technology, we can see that, that precedes the MGAS about 10 years or more. So if you sum the number of years that an MGAS required to progress, and the number of years that the MGAS requires to be detectable, comparing, you know, a mass spec, for example, versus a standard electrophoresis, like in this study from the Mayo Clinic, or this study from the NCI and Ola Langren on uh, um, using a free light chain and, and other uh, immune marker, you can see that for most of the patients, we can actually identify evidence of clonal expansion 10 years before the MGAS. So our estimates may not be perfect, but I think suggests that the history of multiple myeloma is longer than we thought. So just a small parenthesis, because uh, um, uh, this methodology may also be uh, important and how to use it also to understand better the relationship between certain events and uh, the uh, pathogenesis or evolution of cancer. So we know that certain environmental exposure like uh, orange agent in Vietnam or the 9-11 for the first responders like firefighters and police from New York uh, have shown an increased incidence and prevalence of MGAS as uh, moldering and myeloma. So the question is, uh, were these patients, uh, had these patients acquired these clonal expansions at the time of 9-11 or for the 9-11, or they had already some pre-existing undetectable condition that was kind of facilitate in its progression by the 9-11. So that is like, obviously it's not easy to collect this data and this is like a small batch, but in this study that's currently under review, we show that for most of the multiple myeloma, the, the, the red, we have evidence that uh, these patients had already before the 9-11 an event or like some kind of clonal expansion with these trisomies. And for some MGAS, we have evidence that were acquired after. So let's say that using this methodology, you can better understand the relationship between cancer and environment. And you can also, um, and this allows us also to keep in mind that this relationship is not necessarily an initiating relationship. It's not that the environment always cause or create the clone, but may promote the clone or facilitate its progression. So the summary of this first part uh, is on, based only on mutational signature is that we have uh, at least eight main mutational processes active in multiple myeloma. And the first uh, multi-gain events, these multiple trisomies, uh, is often acquired during the second and third decades of life. And obviously this um, and this kind of reconstructing the life history of this cancer, it's important because it allows us to better understand the cancer etiology and cancer um, pathogenesis. So uh, the third, uh, uh, let's say, part of the uh, menu is structural variants. So completely different from mutational signatures. The only things that they have in common, well, it's not the only things, but the main things that they have in common is that you need wood genome sequencing. So this is why it's important to get wood genome sequencing data in multiple myeloma, because without wood genome sequencing data, the mutational signature resolution is pretty low and the structural variance uh, is impossible to be defined. So uh, what are structural variants and complex event? Uh, just a brief introduction. We know that we identify structural variants uh, has uh, uh, reads uh, that uh, spam from one breakpoint to another that is positioned in a different 
locations. So it can be a deletion when you have a reads in positive and negative. And here you have your deletion. You have a tandem duplication, which is like a small game, or you may have an inversion or a translocation, like these unbalanced translocations. So these obviously can be seen also using a copy number, like SNP array, obviously. But with the SNP array, for example, these two deletions looked independent, or these two deletion, they would be considered independent. So having the genome resolution, we can actually link these two deletion, and we can say these two deletions were caused by the same event. So these are the simple structural variants, what we call single or simple. Then we go to the complex structural variants, which it's really fascinating and really what makes multiple meloma a unique hematological cancer. So the, there are three main complex events that we defined recently in this paper that we uh, published, uh, like he's now in, uh, out uh, uh, on blood cancer discovery, like a few weeks ago. And uh, chromotripsis, it's, it's kind of uh, um, uh, a concept that uh, it's, let's say, famous in cancer genomics and, and represent this a shattering of one or two chromosomes. So you can see that multiple pieces are like divided, break, and then reassemble in the wrong way, like uh, creating what we can say a mess. So this vertical line are uh, uh, structural variants, blue inversion, uh, green tunnel duplication, red deletion, and uh, uh, black uh, translocation. So this one is one example on chromosome 17 that can cause deletion. This is the copy number. You see deletion here is one copy on this segment. But also focal gain, we have nine copies, for example, of these genes cap one. And the other thing that chromotrypsy involves large part of the genomes with this like shattering and clustered events. So you can see all these translocations and inversion involving NMSET, 4P, 20P deletion, T53 deletion, MAF translocation, CLD deletion, uh, TRAF3 deletion, MAX deletion, and MIC translocation. All these events occur following one single mitosis, one single catastrophic event. So that's chromotripsy. That's why important, because it's one single event that create, uh, potentially, uh, introduce multiple drivers. Like in this case, obviously, it's an emblematic example. In this case, we have less drivers. But the amount of disruption is huge. And what is huge is that it's present in 20%, 20 30% of multiple melanoma patients. And it's also associated with poor uh, survival. The other concept uh, in, of complex event that we found is chromoplexy, which is quite known in prostate cancer, for example, and is a concatenation of deletion. So what does it mean? That you have translocations, like this trough translocation between this 16, uh, 14 uh, Q deletion, trough, supported by two translocations. One translocation here, you can see the copy number profile with the deletion, uh, where trough is, here is trough. One translocation is on chromosome 11. Uh, and the other is not on chromosome 11, it's on chromosome 13. So here you have another deletion supported on this other breakpoint by another translocation on chromosome 11. So you have a kind of a chain that create three deletions all at the same time because TRAF to be deleted needs both translocations. Burke to be deleted, it needs both translocations, both breakpoints. So again, the importance of complex events is that they occur simultaneously over time acquiring multiple drivers and multiple cytogenetic events. Chromoplex is present in 11% of multiple melanoma patients. Finally, templated insertion, uh, which is probably one of our favorite because it's uh, unique to multiple meloma in terms of prevalence. 21% of multiple meloma patients with multiple meloma have a templated insertion, and there is no other cancer, solid hematological cancer, with such high prevalence. And uh, it's similar to chromoplexy in its logic, so it's a concatenation. But differently from chromoplexy, it doesn't cause deletion, it causes focal gain. So this one is a nice example. The blue line is the copy number. So here is a gain. You can see there is like uh, one level up. Here is another gain and here is another gain. And the same concept of chromoplexy, you have a translocation here going on chromosome 15 between MIC and chromosome 15. And the other copy number break of this focal gain on chromosome 15 map on chromosome 20Q11, IG lambda where you have the other breakpoint of this copy number gain mapping again on mix. So these three gains are actually strung together and inserted somewhere in the genome. So these are like a simple example. This one is a more complex event where you have the cyclin D1, you have IgH, you have a, a 
BCMA, this gene map for BCMA, the target for CAR-T, and KLF2. And what is interesting, all these others breakpoints you can see here, most of the time are super enhancers. Like here, you can see the uh, enrichment of super enhancers that are represented in this figure with these uh, uh, brown uh, boxes. So that is an important uh, event that promote gain of function uh, uh, hit. So this one is uh, uh, the overall uh, uh, summary of our study. We investigate the COMPASS 752 low coverage log insert genomes. And we are really thankful to MMRF for releasing this data and to Jonathan Keats uh, uh, for the high quality of data generation. That it's really impressive the job that they have done. Um, you can see the distribution of mutation this is the number of mutation uh, distributed in different groups uh, according to the canonical cytogenetic classification. Uh, HRD is hyperdeployed. Uh, these are patients without any particular uh, alterations. And uh, just to let you know that what I mentioned before, that the presence of chromotripsy, which is the um, events, the, the, the purple, you can see that patients with chromotripsy have more structural variants because obviously chromotripsy has more structural variants as a event. So if you have a, a chromotripsy, for sure you have 10 structural variants because that's how a threshold define chromotripsis. So you have generally more trans trans structural variants than other cases. And presence of chromotripsy is associated with poor outcome. The blue line is chromotripsy, the red is not for progression free and for overall survival. And when we model in a Cox uh, uh, multivariate, analysis chromotripsy, you can see that chromotripsy retain its significance when correct for like all possible factors, gender, age, treatment, ISS. So chromotripsy, it's really a strong prognostic factor and it's much more, more frequent than what previously reported like 10 years ago by the French that report like in less than 2% of cases. So 20, 24% of multiple aberration have chromotripsis. These patients tend to co-occur with the unf uh, unfavorable prognostic factors like T53, APOVEC, uh, poor translocations. So this is another marker that can help to better define high-risk multiple myeloma. So the last part of this uh, structural variance paper that I think uh, um, has a, an important contribution of Evan Rusted, uh, our former postdoc now back in Norway, he, he made an amazing job. And one of his analysis, probably the best contribution in this story is the uh, hotspot discovery. So when we think about hotspot, we think about regions in uh, myeloma genomes that are recurrently eat by structural variants, like cyclin D1 or FH, uh, MMZ, MSD2. So these genes that we know are recurrently translocated, but obviously these are the famous one, right? The one that everyone knows since forever. And uh, so we wanted to look something new. So we integrated all these structural variants, complex, single, in this very complicated model. We release the code. So if you are a, a genomic geek like us, you can go on the paper page and there is a full R code with full data. You can reproduce all our analysis. And we identify 68 structural variants hotspot. So many of these are obviously known. You can see here the distribution of hotspot all over the genomes. Obviously, this big peak is IgH, cyclin D1, MIC on chromosome 8, and MSET. Then you have a hotspot that you expect to have, like uh, CDK and 2C, or hotspot on uh, um, CDK and uh, 2A, for example, here. Uh, this is MAX. Uh, uh, we have a CLD. So we have different hotspots that are kind of known or are known to be genes that are currently mutated, or we have copy number associated, and that doesn't surprise me because copy number and structural variants are just the same uh, process from uh, just a different perspective. And here we summarize how this entire process uh, uh, work. Um, you can see this one is the cumulative copy number for, for example, this hotspot. This one is the contribution of the different classes. Black is structural variants, uh, uh, is uh, um, translocations. Uh, uh, brown is deputed uh, uh, insertion, and uh, green is uh, uh, tiny duplication. So three type of events that usually tends to cause a gain of function. And in fact, the cumulative copy number you can see here it's a, a focal deletion here, a, a focal gain. Sorry, the blue is gain. 
And the region, the gene that is focally gained by all these events is BCMA. So for example, we identify that BCMA, that we know is a target, it is a therapeutic target in multiple myeloma, like in emerging one for biospecific CAR-3 and monoclonal antibody, is actually amplified and overexpressed in RNA sequencing in two, 3% of multiple myeloma patients, usually through this uh, gain of function or complex event. Or SLAM S7, again, is a target for elotuzumab, CS1, uh, uh, anti CS1 uh, monoclonal antibody. And you can see here the focal gain mostly support by tandem duplication. And just to show how a loss of function gain uh, in hotspot the work, you have this uh, deletion, red uh, peak in terms of density. And here you have your cumulative copy number that exactly map on CDK and to A. So we define multiple hotspot, potential therapeutic, and 17 of these genes were genes that are known to have maybe a role in multiple myeloma, but never reported to be altered in terms of mutations, copy numbers, so this is like what we call new potential candidate drivers. So the summary of the structural variance effort that I hope gives you the idea or like an impression why genome sequencing is so important for multiple myeloma, for acute myeloid leukemia, for chronic leukemia, leukemia, genomes have been done and they did not find anything like striking or important. So now people are not doing it anymore. But in multiple myeloma, really, this is the right technology. And so we identify this new uh, hotspot using structural variants, a genome-wide structural variance approach. We identify these uh, catastrophic events like chromotripsy in a very high uh, frequency, 24%, and also with poor outcome. And again, the platelet insertion is very uh, unique in terms of prevalence. Almost 20% of patients have uh, an event and involve uh, no known genes, but also new uh, drivers. This is the paper, I'm just reporting the work art, but also because it's not on PubMed, uh, is in the process to be released on PubMed, but still uh, is all impressed on the journal page. So the, what we can say the grand finale of this presentation is try to combine all these concepts that I gave you and try to answer to this question, can we genome sequencing based features, what I presented, differentiate stable and progressive myeloma precursor disease? So what we want is something like that, where you have uh, this is like the risk of progression for precursor. We have, we can identify these patients that will never progress and these patients that will progress. So these actually are actual data, but obviously we have the prior knowledge who progress who's not. So you will not find this in the paper when it will be published. But uh, we know that MGAS, is moldering and MGAS have been uh, studied and sequenced and analyzed through different technology, mostly exome and targeted sequencing. There are no genomes uh, on MGAS and few genome of smoldering. And the problem with MGAS is that the amount of cells that you can extract and sort is too low. So you don't have enough DNA to actually sequence MGAS. That's one of the main problem. And the other problem obviously is that you don't do usually M uh, marrow to MGAS or stable MGAS unless you have some doubts or suspect that this MGAS may be smoldering or might progress. So to solve this issue in collaboration with the Hassel University in Belgium, and with Sanger Institute, we uh, use uh, some of the MGAS low cellularity samples. And we use this new technology of low input genome sequencing developed by Peter Kamal and Max Tractor and the Welcome Sanger Institute, which is based on the different uh, fragmentation of the DNA based on enzyme and not on sonication. And the summary of this is that you can sequence 3,500, uh, 2,000 cells with genome sequencing, get the same quality that you get sequencing uh, 100,000. So that's kind of a really cool technology that has been developed for normal tissue. And this, I think, is the first study where is implemented for cancer. So here you have uh, the story of the entire precursor core that we sequence, some using this technology. For others, we have enough material to go with the bulk sequencing. And you can see that the purple are the one that progress and the blue are the one that were stable. So we have also stable patients for like more than five years. So now we have like three slides where I summarize exactly, and some of the features are really similar to what I already shown. So this one is the mutational signatures. And you can see that there are different mutation signatures are present in uh, all different groups, uh, multiple uh, precursor, stable precursor, progressive precursor, Unidex multiple myeloma, relapse multiple myeloma, but the main difference here is APOVEC. 
you see that there is no orange except for these two patients in the precursor stable, but in almost all progressive precursor, you have Apovec and the same for multiple myeloma. And here, obviously, statistically significant. But what about these two? So why do they have Apovec? So again, we go back and we check for 3A, 3B ratios. So to try to identify if this is canonical Apovec or is a hyper Apovec activity. And what we found, these two blue dots, maybe too small, but uh, now we are highlighted with this green circle. These are patients with hyperapobic, and both cases in the stable have hyperapobic, and both cases have uh, MAF translocations. So it's the canonical apobic activity was not detected in any stable MGAS. The non canonical or hyperapobic was detected as expected in MAF translocated cases. But this doesn't surprise because we know that apobic in these cases start to act. Uh, immediately after the initiation. So these are data that just confirm what already reported by Irene Gobrial and Dana Farber with Mark Bustorus on uh, a large cohort of exome and targeted match and match cases. Uh, and the summary is that MGAS that are stable over time have a rare involvement of uh, oncodrivers in terms of mutations. So KRAS and RAS DNA repair are usually not mutated. Uh, while in progressive, they are mutated. Uh, we uh, expand our code with some exome provided by Garrett Morgan and Brian Walker. So uh, coming back to why genome is important, uh, structural variance. And you can see that the distribution of structural variance between stable, progressive, and multiple myeloma, it's clearly different. So you don't have structural variance here, or they are so rare. Here are the, the genomic distribution. You, you just have canonical events like cyclin E1, IgH translocation, for example, but there are no complex events if not for this single chromotripsy here. Why in the progressive, 40% have chromotripsis, which is like identical to the multiple myeloma or not statistically different. And uh, also the number of tempered insertion, it's even more striking. There is no tempered insertion in this table, but there are a lot of tempered insertion in the progressive is this small red that you can see here. And finally, coming back to the 68 hotspot, you can see that stable don't have hotspot. If not for second D1, this patient with second D1, this patient with second D3, and these patients with this LTB1 translocation between LTB1 and IgH, what we call the non canonical IgA translocations. While hotspot are present in the progressive, in particular MIC. Have been reported uh, very recently by uh, the uh, Leaf Bersaga group. And in multiple myeloma, obviously, you have a lot of this output. Finally, we show in summary, with this like couple of slides, that MGAS that are stable over time don't have what we call genomic uh, um, def uh, myeloma uh, genomic defining events like chromotripsis, apobec, preparatory insertion, mutations on certain drivers, uh, and involvement on certain hotspots. But someone can always say, well, you know, you don't see them because these are MGAS uh, that will take a lot of time to progress. So you're just looking at something that has not progressed yet and it will take maybe 20 years to progress. So it, there might be a time bias. And so how can we solve this? Obviously, it might be a tricky question, but luckily for us, we developed this molecular time approach. So we have that the stable, precursor, progressive and multiple myeloma in our court, they don't differ in terms of age, like at the diagnosis or the sample collection. But when we look at the time of the first multi-gain events with the same methodology using CH1 and 5, as I showed you before, you can see that multiple myeloma and progressive have a large time lag. The MGAS that are stable or smoldering that are stable over time are have a very short time lag. It's less than, it's like 11, 15 years versus 40 years. So it's not just the genomic landscape that is different, but also the temporal acquisition. So MGAS are probably something different, not just genomically, but also temporally or stable MGAS because we have MGAS that progress and they have exactly the same features that you can see in multiple myeloma. So this uh, kind of prophetic picture that Garrett Morgan published in 2012 with the evolution of multiple myeloma, we can probably change it or like adjust the saying that there is an entity MGAS stable or non-progressive or indolent that is completely different temporally and genomically. And I think this is critical because 
this means that in the future, with wood genome sequencing or with some feasible, uh, cheaper and easier to perform surrogate, we can define which patient will progress independently from the disease burden at the MGA stage. So that's obviously it, what a lot of people in myeloma glooming have, have been trying uh, to find or to demonstrate. So I want to conclude this talk. Uh, uh, thank you, first of all, all of you for the attention and all our uh, team uh, uh, and collaborators, in particular, Gareth Morgan and NYU, uh, my mentor, Peter Campbell and Sanger, uh, our Belgian friends, uh, Nicola Bolli, and many, many others that contribute to all these uh, papers and ongoing studies. And obviously a great thank to uh, Ola Langren uh, and all our labs, our funders, patients, and uh, I'm happy to uh, answer to any of your questions. And just because we are in the middle of the moving, uh, the lab uh, is like splitting parties, staying to the Memorial Sloan Catering, and another part is following me and Ola Langren to this new enterprise, to the Sylvester Cancer Center in Miami, where uh, we will start to this lab next year. And we will open also some position, someone might be interested. <laughs> and uh, that's it, and I'm happy to answer to any questions. Thanks very much for that talk. That was uh, phenomenal. Um, I guess I'm kind of curious um, about kind of directions going from here. One thing that that I think maybe you could apply this technology and the sequencing approach um, could be more the progression from like early stage myeloma to late stage um, myeloma, you know, from a disease that basically is controllable with medications to one that is um, deadly uh, and drug resistant. Do you, and I like your kind of uh, very visual explanation of the chromatography as, as like an explosion genomically ex uh, exploding. Do those events, are they really, you think, uh, important as drivers, but not necessarily progression events? Or do other things happen at progression? Um, are there ways that you can kind of um, use these kind of amazing algorithms to, to give us more information about what happens later in the disease myeloma itself? So that's, I mean, it's a great question and it's an area that uh, we and others are trying to understand because there are so many publications on exome targeted on relapse multiple myeloma. And I think in my mind, no data supporting a clear mechanism of resistance. So uh, one explanation might be that we are looking in the wrong direction. So it might be that there are like post transcriptional non DNA based mechanism and that's possible. Uh, another way, is that uh, there are DNA events uh, that we just don't know because so far people just look at exome and targeted data. So we have obviously a small series that we published in 2018 with Peter and Nikhil Munshi. And the, the, um, what we show is that at relapse or at different time, uh, temporal, uh, uh, different samples collect a different time point, you have a clear path of selection and acquisition of events. Regarding chromotripsy, what is fascinating is that chromotripsy is usually not acquired later. It's always conserved. So what we think chromotripsy is something that is initiating. So this is why you see chromotripsy in MGAS and smoldering that will progress because it's kind of a funding event. It's almost like in IJS translocations. While what you see, for example, is chromoplexy, is templated insertion, are other complex events or focal events, or what we are investigating is rare events People always look at common events like CID or T53, but what about genes that are just mutated in 0.01% of multiple myeloma? You will never have the statistical power to see them using like the computational approach that we implemented with the uh, Evan for structural variant, but they might be super important in that patient because that patient was treated with a certain drugs and that event somehow creates some certain fitness and proliferation advantage. So I think we are just beginning for the relapse uh, settings to understand uh, or to work out some approaches. Um, but also it's difficult because as you know, multiple myeloma has so many new drugs and every year <laughs> things are changing. So you may spend five years to study bortezomib and then bortezomib is like uh, retired. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not easy, but we are trying, uh, thanks to Ola Langren, to right now sequencing in uh, real-time patients like in phase two and phase three randomized trial like even before they progress so it's like try to keep up with the uh, fast uh, development of drugs in our field okay great and anyone else who wants to ask a question please uh, go feel free to take off your uh, 
um, video or put on your video and uh, uh, interrupt me. But um, I guess I'll just pick up on something he said was um, I found it very interesting that BCMA, you pulled that out as a potential driver as a, you know, a target of immune therapies. Uh, but I, I didn't quite understand exactly what's, what's changing there. Is it that, uh, is it, was it just an altered version of BCMA? Is it still being expressed on the surface or? So uh, we didn't look at the protein, uh, unfortunately, okay. because it's, uh, we didn't have this uh, material. But the idea is that, uh, uh, let me take the right slide here. So you should imagine something like that. For most of the BCMA, you have a focal gain on BCMA. So one copy of BCMA is, let's say, taken and is combined with super enhancers or other drivers somewhere and inserted somewhere. So it's stable. It's not like double minutes or typhonas, these like 50 copies of circulating DNA that you have in solid cancer. We don't have that in multiple melanoma. Multiple melanoma, it's much simpler than solid cancer. But still, uh, this event is fascinating because this is not circular DNA. This derivative chromosome with these three pieces, for example, is reinserted. So it's a stable structure. It's stable. It doesn't acquire multiple copies. And the super enhancer hijacking create a super, the, like the overexpression. So what we see for VCMA is a massive expression in gene expression. It's like the same effect that you see for cyclin E1 when you have one, two, three log more expression in patients that are translocated, you see in BCMA. So obviously uh, we need to check the protein. We need to check clinical trials to see if patients with this overexpression respond better to anti-BCMA. And you know better than me that you know, post transcription process can always alter BCMA. So you have an overexpression without the protein expression. So obviously that's kind of a beginning, but these are baseline patients. So these are naive, which means that some patients might actually benefit from BCMA target therapy in a certain settings. I mean, these are small group, but still uh, there are cancer with the smaller groups that are treated with these stick drugs. I mean, promyelocytic le leukemia is so rare and they like, develop an amazing therapy. So I would say, why not <laughs> try and <Yes. laughs> So one of, the, one of the, the question in the chat was, uh, how old is your son? He was a cute addition to your talk. <laughs> yeah, I have two, three. <laughs> so he's, he, he tried to break into the room. Uh, so he, he's, uh, uh, I have a three years old and uh, five years old and yeah, five years old son and one is coming. So we'll be three boys. Very good. Yeah, that, that was actually my first related. My first question was if you were going to Miami uh, with Ola. So uh, congratulations on your on your new uh, on your move. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, so far. I mean, I'm still working for MSK and from home because that's COVID uh, here until this pass. But uh, yeah, thank you. Exciting. <laughs> yes. So. If there are no other questions, uh, I guess maybe we'll let you go meet with the students in a few minutes, give you a, a five minute break. Yeah, and if you have any questions, you have my contact, feel free to reach me by email. I usually fast to reply. Okay, thanks for the talk. Right, thank you very much.